so not far from her home, she followed that path to something unexpected. She couldn't stay though. She had to find her other two children. So she took that path. She followed it towards something ancient. Something with answers. The fox looked high and low, searching for any sign of her cubs. Points of light showed the way to this ancient tree. It was as if each one had a story to tell all their own. The land was trying to tell my story, too. I felt like I was right behind her the whole time. way of putting it. If wood was a canvas, then a carving knife was his paintbrush. Even after working a 50-hour week, even after his hands were more splinters than skin, he would bring home the nicest piece of Alaskan weeping cedar and make me toys. That wooden train was the first toy I can remember, and I loved it. I just knew from a young age I was going to be a lumberjack, like my father. My teenage years were full of sketching, angst, and trouble. I wasn't popular or unpopular. Maybe just forgettable. I guess that gave me a sense of freedom. So I hung out with crazy kids, doing crazy things, even though I mostly just watched the chaos ensue. We did it all. Put fireworks in mailboxes, hide roadkill in people's garages, break windows at the barber shop in Anchorage. My dad was furious. But he was so busy working, he couldn't do much to stop me from going out. I think being an adult means there's no one to stop you making hard decisions. He had to make a living, and he couldn't be in two places at once. Yeah, I realize that now. But at the time, I was sure he was more interested in growing his business than what was going on with me. He was working another late night, and my friends were over. 
saying how bored they were and how they had come all the way out to my house for nothing. One of them mentioned how that old, ugly beyond belief truck was still in the garage and how we should take it for a spin. I was only 15, so I kind of fought it for a while. The next thing I knew, we were craning around the mountain path, rocks spitting onto the sides of the cliff while my dad's cringeworthy bluegrass blared out the speakers. I drove while my friends were in the back of that yellow and purple truck, throwing beer bottles and trash at anything remotely interesting. Felt like I was soaring in the air with borrowed wings. But all good things have endings. A cop outside of Eagle River pulled us over after he saw us in a bottle rocket into someone's yard. What followed was a long night of talking to disappointed adults and feeling smaller than ever. After he drove me home from the police station, I blew up at him, saying how I never wanted to be like him, how I was going to be someone and leave that hick icebox for good. He just looked forward at the road with tired eyes. I took out that bluegrass tape from the cassette deck and chucked it out the window. In my sage teenage wisdom, I thought I had proved the ultimate point, but my dad had a different idea. He slammed the brakes slowly bowed his head while gripping the steering wheel and finally looked at me. All he said, like it was a polite request, was, make this right. I sat there in silence fuming, but I eventually got out and combed every square inch of the woods, muttering profanity after profanity. I found it 30 minutes later, near a small waterfall off the road. I went back to the truck, put the wet tape back in. And sure enough, it worked. We didn't speak another word to each other the rest of the night. Wow, I knew you were a crazy teenager, but... It's hard to believe, isn't it? It surprises me, too. It's like I didn't really know who that kid was back then. I bet my dad thought the same thing over and over. It's almost like he was saying, make this right to himself more than to me.
property, there were old abandoned pieces of a shed and car long left unused. I used to ask him all the time who those people were that left all this junk, and I'm sure he got so tired of hearing it that he made up some elaborate stories how a brown bear ate them and haunted the woods afterwards. What's funny is I think it made those people seem more real, growing up thinking they were still hanging out like they couldn't say goodbye. I used to tell my friends how I could swear I saw spirits move near the water, and that always freaked them out. I guess it didn't bother me, because the way I saw it, they were normal people with old cars and sheds, just trying to figure out how to survive and be happy in the middle of nowhere. It was a cool thought that they didn't want to leave, but you know, I was a weird kid. Well... You had good company since those ghosts like living in a place where they were brutally devoured. when I detested him the most. He kept reaching out. For a year straight, he asked me every week when we were going camping. I thought he was just dense. Eventually, to shut him up, I agreed. We carried out the worn lawn chairs from the garage and set up a cinder block campfire at the site we'd always used behind the house. We walked down the mountain path Talking in the warm sunshine, we only got a couple months of the year. Those three obsidian rocks shimmered alongside the shore, almost like sparklers pressed against a dark window. I'll never forget that wet stone on my feet, or how those massive mountains looked even bigger in the lake's reflection. I felt small, but grateful. As the sun set, my dad found something I hadn't seen for a long time the tree where I'd made my first carving when I was six. I hadn't even carved it. My dad had helped me, but I still called it my tree. Something about seeing my name there made me open up, and we talked about everything that night in that old camouflage tent. I told him how much I love sketching and design, and how it would be a dream to study architecture in Seattle. I told him how I didn't get along with my friends much anymore, but that I didn't mind being alone. He told me he was there for me, and he joked that if all he had to do was write my name on a tree to finally get me to talk, he would have left me carved logs with novels on them in front of my room every morning. <laughs> I don't know why it took me that long to realize it, but it was then I knew how much he had sacrificed for me. the birds in the morning before the school bus came. <laughs> I thought that my mother was one of those birds, and it made me want to be free like her. My mom taught me how to fold origami cranes while she was in the hospital, so I told myself I would fold one every day until I could fly myself. I think we both have always loved animals, and for me that love started with a dog. Sometimes this Rottweiler would come up to our property line and wait at the fence for me, but only once in a while. I was sure to check every day immediately after school, and it usually ended in disappointment. I would even steal money from my passed out dad just so I could buy these off-brand dog biscuits. Even when she did stop by, she never went beyond the fence. Why was she so scared? I think my dad was the opposite of your dad, and 
almost every way. Except he was in the military as well. He coped with alcohol of every kind. The trailer started falling apart, he got angry, and I withdrew. More and more I became the weird, quiet kid who made lots of origami birds and carried dog biscuits around. I think we were pretty similar when it came to being the weird kids. And that same sincerity in college was one of the reasons I was so drawn to you. Life got worse and worse. And at one point, I really didn't think I could survive another day with my soul still intact. I had no real friends, let alone neighbors, since we lived in the middle of nowhere. I should have talked to my teacher, but I was scared what he would do if he found out. As I waited for the school bus one morning, I walked around until I found something in an abandoned shed. Something I can't put into words. I summoned courage I didn't know I had, and I broke into my dad's room and found the key to the shed where he had locked my bike. I'll never forget that feeling. The wind rushing by my ears as the sun rose over fields of wheat. I was flying for the first time. I biked as far as my legs could take me until I found a house that felt friendly and that felt like home. Those strangers helped me in so many ways. And if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have found my foster family. And if it wasn't for my parents, I wouldn't have met you. You have strength, Joseph. And you're not as alone as you think. It's all just so pointless. Just waiting for life to happen. It's like having the home I always wanted is cursed out of my reach. The thought of being a parent myself. How could I do that when I couldn't even be a good son? I'm sorry. I know what you're saying. I just don't know how things will work out. These quiet hours will turn into years. We'll wonder which roads passed us by. Then we'll forge a new road, together. Besides, I discovered for myself that one fateful morning where any hopeful road leads to. There may be thorns in this, but it always leads to the same thing. And what's that? Family. I'm so glad that you're part of my family, Rachel. And I'm glad you're part of mine.